did. Make yourself comfortable because uh, this is a sermon that I have been anticipating for several weeks. I've been preparing and so I plan to go long at least an hour and a half. What's, what's that, Francis? Give us patience, Lord. Amen. Amen. No, I'm teasing. I said that at the early, er, earlier service. I said, oh, it looks like we got about two hours until the next service, so I planned to go long. And uh, they held in there, and I ended up going short. Now, I don't know if they were happy about that or sad, but uh, I have been looking forward to this message. We're in this series called The Questions That Jesus Asked, and the question that Jesus asked today is, do you see anything? Now, I'm going to reframe that question throughout the sermon, and I'll get to that in a moment, but I find it very interesting that in today's story, uh, the healing, Jesus has to do it twice. Now, we're talking about the Son of God, the most powerful person ever walked the earth, who the creator of heaven and earth, and he had to heal this guy twice. What in the world is going on here? I mean, last week we talked about the woman who he didn't even touch. She touched his robe and she was healed. So why is it in today's healing story that he has to go back a second time? It reminds me of a conversation I was having several weeks ago with someone. We had, were having lunch together and getting to know each other and, and trying to uh, understand how we both got called into ministry. And so we were sharing our stories with each other. And during this conversation, he asked this question, why is it that God doesn't make me whole all at once. Why is it God can't take care of all my sin, all my addiction, all of my whatever it is, obstacles to grace, all at once? And I said, I'm with you. I hear you. I get it. I understand. I have some of my own stuff that I wish God was just take, just take care of it. I said, here's my theory. God has the power to heal us and break addictions and do all kinds of amazing things in his time. And sometimes that's like turning on and off a light switch. Just like that, we're cured. I said, on the other hand, there are things that God wants to work through us and in us and it takes time to reveal those truths to us so that we can be fully on board with God's will. And he said, yeah, but... I said, well, it's like this. It's another light switch, but this time it's a dimmer switch. You know what I mean? It slowly turns off. And I says, it's, you can read about that in the Bible, too. I mean, th uh, Paul even proclaimed that throughout his whole life and ministry, there was a thorn in his side. There was something agitating him that God refused to make whole. Yet, when we surrender to his will and allow his love and his mercy and his grace to illuminate our lives, we are therefore putting ourselves in a position for full healing. Amen? So oftentimes, the only obstacle to grace is the things that we choose, the decisions that we make, the judgments that we pass, the assumptions that we live by, right? But when we start really falling in love with Jesus and really aligning our will with his, I believe that's when true healing can happen. And so here's this blind man wanting to see again, begging Jesus to heal him. And Jesus spits in his hands, mm, tell me what you see. Can you see anything? And the man's response is, well, I see people, they are like trees that are walking. There's some preachers out there that may want to say, well, Jesus didn't have a, he wasn't having a full God day in the moment. 
right? Like he had to go back and pray again. Okay, let's do it again. But I don't think that was what was really going on. I think there was something more. Something that I like to refer to as spiritual blindness. Those things that help us understand that we don't quite have 2020 vision or kingdom vision as God calls us to have as of yet. Let me share a couple stories with you and kind of illustrate this point I'm trying to make. The first uh, story is about this uh, plane that had a really long trip. They came and they landed in an airport and it was a full flight and it was a layover. So uh, the pilot, after the safety, the fast and safe seatbelt sign went off, the pilot came over the in intercom and said, listen folks, he says, we're gonna be here at least 90 minutes. We wanna give you the opportunity to get up, get off the plane, go stretch your legs, go get a coffee, uh, and then come back um, because we, we still have a, a journey ahead of us. And so everybody got up and got off the plane with joy and the pilot came out of the uh, cockpit, started walking through the plane to do his normal inspection and he saw one gentleman still sitting there. And he walked up and he noticed that the gentleman was blind and he had a service dog with him. And he said, sir, he said, I don't know if you heard, but um, we're going to be here a while. You're more than, more than welcome to get up and get off the plane, stretch your legs, and, uh, and then come back. We're gonna, we're, we still have a long journey. And the blind man said, I heard you. I'm okay. I appreciate that. He said, but I'm sure my dog would like to stretch his legs. Could you take him for a walk? And the pilot said, I'd be glad to. Now imagine the fear that came over the, the passengers over at Starbucks that just got off the plane that sees their pilot walking out, sunglasses on, holding a guide dog. Oh my, right? Oh my. What came over them was fear. What came over them was irrational fear. So much so that they started going to other uh, air, air, uh, airlines and say, hey, can, when's your next flight, right? They're wanting to change their flight. Which gets back to that question, do you see anything? And here's how I want to reframe that question. What do you see and who do you see? What do you see and who do you see? Do you see a blind pilot? Do you see your own life in jeopardy? Or do you see someone with a servant's heart going above and beyond the call of duty? Do you see the opportunity to help someone in need? All right, our, that's story number one. Story number two, and uh, I'm going to uh, kind of preface this with, I believe I've shared this story before, but I am, I've been told I can say it seven times before I have to completely discard it. So if you've heard it before, I know I've only, well, I'm sure, okay, I'm almost sure that I've only shared it with you one other time. But hopefully this helps with the illustration of what do you see and who do you see. So about 15, 16 years ago, I was in a group, an accountability group with some other men. And in the midst of that group, we were praying for one of the men's brother. His name is Keith. Keith had uh, basically lost his marriage, lost his house, was homeless, living on the streets because he had become addicted to methamphetamines. And so we had been praying for Keith. And we came up with a plan, the three of us, to try to help Keith. My role in our plan, since I still own my business, was to employ Keith. And so we did, I did. Uh, Keith's brother housed him. 
I employed him, and the third person, Mark, would pray for us daily. Now, we all prayed, but Mark had specific hours that he would pray for Keith, right? And so this went on for several months, six months, actually. And I can tell you, it was a roller coaster of a ride. There were some days where, where Keith would show up, and there was other days where I would have to go pick him up somewhere in Columbus because he had lost, lost his way, right? But we were making progress. And, uh, and one day when we were working in Columbus, we were coming up 71, and I got off uh, the interstate to go to another job in Clintonville, and I saw a homeless person at the, at the intersection, and so God prompted me to, to give what I had. I opened up my wallet. I had, all I had was a $20 bill. So I, I grabbed it, rolled down my window, and handed it to the person, and the person said, God bless you, man. And I said, he has. He already has, and I hope he blesses you today. And as we pulled away, Keith just went irate. He was so upset with me. He says, you don't understand. You just gave that, that guy money so he could go buy drugs. And I says, well, I don't know what he's going to do with it, but I know what God told me to do. And he goes, you, and he, he got more elevated. He said, you don't understand. He's conning you. He's ripping you off. He's going to take that money and he's going to go and buy drugs. And I said, how, what makes you so sure? And he says, I know because I was that same guy six months ago on that same corner looking for suckers just like you. And I said, Keith, all we can do is give it over to the Lord. Two weeks later, we were in a Saturday morning Bible study, and I happened to lean over to Keith, and I said, Keith, did you catch the news this week? He goes, yeah, which part? I said, the part about the man with the golden voice. You all remember that story? The man with the golden voice. Somebody else had come a few days later on that same corner and heard his voice and was able to get him off the streets into rehab and in, back into radio production or TV production broadcasting because he had this beautiful voice. Did he have fall, uh, setbacks in his life? I'm sure he did. But my point is, in saying all of that, goes back to those two questions. What do you see and who do you see? What do you see? Do you see an opportunity to look the other way? Or do you see an opportunity to respond to what God has placed on your heart? Who do you see? Do you see someone homeless? Someone not worthy of your time? Or do you see a brother or sister in Christ in need? I believe that is the heart of what Jesus is getting at in this healing segment around spiritual blindness, trying to usher in kingdom vision, which is 2020, as opposed to the world vision. The world vision that tells us to look the other way, that tells us we might be throwing money away, that tells us that person is not worthy, when in fact, they are. For Jesus said, he came to save the whole world, not just part, not just some, not just us, but the whole world. I love that statement that Jesus is making. When I had to answer my, my theological uh, expression for my DS this, this year, I put that. I love the fact that Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but I came to save it. He came to offer healing for our spiritual blindness. Are you still with me? All right. Almost done, I promise. <laughs> Last story, I think. 
The last one is a biblical story, a biblical reference. A story where a woman has been caught in adultery and the church has brought her to Jesus for judgment. And I love what Jesus is doing in the midst of this scene as it plays out. He's, he's like, uh. I wonder if he's writing the commandments down. Love God, love neighbor, because these knuckleheads don't get it. And the church brings this woman and says, Jesus, you're a teacher of the law. You know that we have the right to stone her to death, to execute judgment for what she has done. You going to back us up? You going to help us out? You going to pick up a stone? Jesus, love God, love neighbor. How many times do I have to write this? They're not getting it. Stands up and says, He who is without sin cast the first stone. One by one, by one, by one. They drop their ammunition. And they turn and walk away. It begs the question, what do, you, what do you see? Who do you see? Do you see an opportunity to bring judgment? Which isn't ours, by the way. To bring judgment upon somebody else? Or do you see an opportunity for grace? Who do you see? Do you, I, one of those phrases that I absolutely cannot tolerate anymore. Oh, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Where is the grace in that? Where is the grace in that? When we have enough of our own baggage to begin with, I'm just saying. Or maybe it's just me. Who do you see? Someone worthy of God's grace? Or someone worthy of our judgment? Jesus would ask, What do you see? Who do you see? For I see a world worth loving, a world worth redeeming, a world worth rescuing. Oh, and by the way, I can't do it on my own. Can you help me out? Can you come alongside? Can you help usher in this kingdom vision where there is no judgment? Only grace? Only mercy? Only forgiveness? And especially love? Oh yeah, that's right. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself and love God with our whole mind, heart, and soul. Can it be so? Can we be vessels used by God to usher in his kingdom? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive our spiritual blindness. Help us to be a people willing to be vulnerable willing to respond to the things that you call us to do, willing to give of ourselves for the sake of others, willing to be able to forgive and to be able to repent of our own sin. But most of all, give us a heart ready to expand to the fullness of love that your Son offers through the work on the cross. In Jesus' name, all God's children said, Amen.